Can you hear me okay? Thank you all for being here today. I'm sorry. Did you say something? Okay. You can hear me okay now? All right, awesome. Thank you. All right. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter to everyone. Thank you all for being here and being part of this ministry and having faith that God is going to teach us something very important today. He's going to remind us of something very important. The message that we have for you this morning, sometimes I'm going to attempt for it to be a little funny sometimes, but most of it's going to be very serious because after all, that's what we're here for, right? To hear the truth, for God to level with us and tell us the truth. That's why we gather together, but we're here to celebrate a very important event that took place. And because it took place, we are free. And we are victorious because of what he has accomplished for us. So we have a lot to be grateful for today. Amen. Amen. So before we get started, let us, let us please, uh, without further ado, because we have a very solid message for you this morning, let us take that moment of silent prayer so we could get right with God, so we can cast away all those worries, whatever they are, if they're there, whatever's terrorizing you. This is the time to cast it away because he truly does care for each and every single one of us. Think about what he did for us, what we're celebrating this morning. So he has proven that to us over and over. So do not worry. Just cast away your cares and put all your faith and confidence in him by, by taking that moment of silent prayer right now with me. As 1 John 1, 9 teaches us that if we acknowledge our sins to him, he is always faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we just want to thank you once again for another opportunity to gather together as your children and to hear what the Spirit is going to say to us, your church, Father, your children. So we are grateful for that opportunity. We're grateful that we can celebrate this resurrection day and know and have the confidence that you have accomplished the goal, that you have crushed death once and for all, Father. And we are so grateful for it. We're so grateful for your word. And we just ask that you bless each and every single one of us as we hear what you are going to teach us this morning, Father. And we ask this in the name of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so before... Let's just get right to it, okay? <laughs> All right. I'm going to start off by having a serious message with you. And it's going to start off by um, telling you about how to the unlooker, the observer, the, someone, the person that doesn't necessarily take the word of God very serious. Many of these so-called holidays that we celebrate seem like an empty ritual. However, for the true believer... To the person that takes the word of God so serious, serious it ha and who has been well informed, these holidays seem more significant than life itself. So I want to give you an illustration this morning. Let's take old Ed down in Florida. So please bear with me while I tell you this story. It has a lot of meaning. Every Friday evening about dark, about the time the sun is just going down, Old Ed comes strolling along the beach to find his way to his favorite pier. He's carrying a bucket. As he strolls along, he is occupied with this because it is sort of a ritual for him. Something that is going on that no one knows about except him. The bucket is full of shrimp, and the shrimp are not for him, and the shrimp are not for the fish either. Strangely enough, the shrimp are for the seagulls. He gets on the pier when that golden sun is beginning to go down and everybody seems to be gone. Maybe there's a few joggers and a couple of people still on the beach sitting on a blanket somewhere. But Ed, alone with his thoughts, walks to the end of the pier with his bucket and he doesn't say a single word. And there is where the ritual begins for him. Before long... You can look up in the sky and you can see what looks like a thousand little dots screeching and squawking, making their way to old Ed there on the end of the pier. They envelop him with their presence and their fluttering wings. They sound like a roar of thunder. 
So Ed stands there and sort of mumbles at them as he's feeding them shrimp. He reaches in his bucket and throws a few up to them. You can almost hear him say, thank you, thank you. So in a few minutes, the bucket is finally empty and Ed stands there almost as if raptured in his thoughts of another time at another place. Invariably, he puts that one last piece of the shrimp above his head and there's a seagull that lands on his old weather-beaten hat and it looks, that hat looks like an old military hat that he's been wearing for years. And then he turns around and he begins to walk on his way back toward the beach. A few of the birds hop along the pier with him until he gets to the stairs of his home and then they finally fly away. And without a word being spoken, just as quietly, quietly as he came, he makes his way down to the end of the beach and back home. Now, if you were to see him do this, you would probably say that this guy, Ed, is a very weird individual. So please, remember this story. It's very very deep. It was told once before behind this pulpit, and it's got a very deep meaning to it, I promise you. And uh, you may not think so right now, but you'll see. It's, a very, it's very deep because it's so much more than what you are probably thinking. And we're going to give you exactly what it is when we close, and you will see the application to this story. Now, first of all, I would like to recall the words of our precious, precious Lord and Savior. Most of you will record what our Lord and Savior said about the importance of this thing called ritual versus reality. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 5 with me, please. If you could turn there. And we studied this, whether it's communion, Easter, the Lord's Supper, or even Christmas service. But notice what our Lord said about ritual or tradition. Mark 7, verse 5. It says, and the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, and they said to him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat their bread with impure hands? They don't wash their hands before Eden. And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. You see, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. And then he calls them hypocrites, by the way. As it is written, he says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain, verse 7, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God. You hold to the tradition of men. We could also say neglecting the doctrines of God, you hold to traditions, the traditions of many churches. He, he was also saying to them, you nicely set aside the doctrines of God in order to keep your tradition. Now, let me repeat a statement I made at the beginning of the service to the onlooker, you know, the observer, the one who's on the outside. Many of the so-called Christian holidays seem like an empty ritual. However, remember to the person who is informed, well informed, they seem so much more significant than anything in this life itself. More significant than life itself. Why? Because as we are going to see this morning, in just a moment, this thing called information, that's why. So go forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, this is what Easter is all about, my friends. This is what Easter is all about. For many people on the earth, for some people, it's very significant. For others, it's just something that you go through. It's just a ritual. It's a tradition. Many Christians do, many Christians do not, do, not say, do, this, do some very strange things when it comes to Easter. And I'm sure many of you can agree with that. They do some very strange things. But I want, I want to ask you a question this morning, all of you. And that is, what does Easter, what does Resurrection Sunday really mean to you? What does it mean to you? Well, I want, I want to give you just a little hint of where we're going to be going with this. And maybe you'll be able to answer that question this morning. If I ask you royal family, to describe Easter without using any words whatsoever, but only using punctuation, punctuation marks. What would you use this morning? Which punctuation mark would you choose to describe your response to today, this day, Resurrection Day, this very day that we are celebrating? Would you use a comma, something that I maybe I need to think about 
about it for a little while? Or would you use a period? It means absolutely nothing to me. A question mark, maybe? I have a lot of questions about it. Or an exclamation point. I am very excited about this day and what this precious day represents. A comma, a period, a question mark, or an exclamation point. Now, a lot of you, I'm sure, have never really been challenged to answer this question personally and seriously. So I'll give you a few minutes to really think about it this morning because maybe you just need a little bit more time to think about what Easter really means to you, you personally. Maybe you just need to stop and, and think and just contemplate for a moment before you answer this very important question. In other words, let's start with a comma. Sort of like a comma in a sentence. What is Easter? And before you even answer this question, put a comma behind that or a comma after that. And think about what does it really mean to me? You see, commas brothers and sisters, are very important because of what they are designed to do. They are designed to cause you and I to think about what has been said and then get ready for something that is coming. It's important. And if you don't think that they're important, if you leave them out of a sentence or two every once in a while, it will cause a lot of confusion. We came across a few illustrations uh, recently that I want to share with you. And the first one I'd like to share with you is concerning a little note that a woman gave to her pastor. Her husband was in the Navy and he had gone out on a ship and of course she was concerned for his safety. So she wrote this little note to her pastor and here it is, Bill Jacobs, comma, having gone to see, comma, his wife desires prayer from the congregation for his safety. So the pastor quickly stuffed this note into his pocket, and when it came time for the morning prayer, he pulled it out and read it, read it rather quickly, overlooking that very important comma, those commas, commas. And so it sounded like this. Bill Jacobs, having gone to see, his wife desires the prayer of the congregation for his safety. Sounds like a scary wife to me. <laughs> you see, commas, commas are very important. The power of a comma. So one of pastor's favorite ones came from a fellow. It's an old story. And a fellow in the church where we will not tell you who he is, but this is an old story. His wife was traveling overseas. She already sounds like a very high-maintenance wife to me. And when she got to Paris, oh, she's definitely high maintenance. <laughs> when she got to Paris, Paris, she finally found this very fabulous bracelet that she had been looking for all of her life. So she sent a telegram back home and said this, I found this beautiful bracelet that I've been looking for all of my life. And it cost only $7,500. That's more like 20,000 bucks today, man. Do you think I can buy it, she says? Well, of course, he hit the ceiling and he freaked out. And he read, when he read it and he wrote back to her sh a very short but very firm reply. And he said, no, comma, price is too high. And then in the transmission, however, the comma was left out once again. And so the message was read like this, no price is too high. Okay, that's pretty funny. Right? That caused this man to obviously go from comma to coma, because I would also, right? <laughs> but anyway, there are commas in life. And for many people, Easter, this precious day, Resurrection Sunday, is just one of those commas. It's a time that makes some people stop and pause and think. But that's about it. It goes no further than that. However, it is really a reminder, a very important reminder. If you take your calling seriously, that is, and your life serious, light, uh, Easter is really a reminder that if it's not reality in your life, the Bible, the only form of literature, by the way, that has been proven to be true over and over, and some of you may recall what we studied in the past about the prophecy of the 173,880 days that the Messiah would come in that first Palm Sunday. Do you remember that? Do you recall that? If you haven't, don't worry. We're going to play it on Monday. Uh, it's going to be Monday noon's message, and you will, get, you, you will be able to, to study it 
and it will give me give you even more confidence. But anyway, you know that this when you when you read things like that and you see how the accuracy of it, you know that this book, this supernatural book, this amazing book that we study, says something that no other book has ever said, can say, or can do. Do you agree with me? But you see, if you don't believe what the Bible has to say about resurrection, I'm here to tell you that life is absolutely meaningless. It means nothing. Look how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul wrote it like this. He said, now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we witnessed against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, verse 19, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now this is what not believing in Easter, or I should say Resurrection Sunday, will produce. And when I say not believing, I'm not referring to just not believing it, I'm referring to not experiencing it, not experiencing the victory, the victory of the resurrection life and what it's all about, for he is alive. So if so, then look at uh, verse 14. This, this means that verse 14 preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. And then in verse 17, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. In verse 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now the point is this, brothers and sisters. For some people today, this is just another day, another reminder of the emptiness and the vanity of their life. And I want to show you something that we believe is so vital for you to see. Turn your Bibles now for a moment to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, please. You see, for so many people today, this morning, for so many people, this is just another day, another day of emptiness, another day of vanity, maybe a little break, maybe a little holiday because of the so-called Friday, a Good Friday celebration. And remember, if that's what this is to you today, then your life, I hate to say it, your life is meaningless. And I'm not attacking anyone. That's not what we're here for. We're here to give everyone hope. Remember, our job here behind this pulpit is to tell you the truth. And I will say what Paul said, have I therefore become your enemy by telling you the truth? And here's the truth. And this is a statement that pastor has rephrased throughout the years, but here it is. Here's the truth. And I want you again to ask yourself this question. question. Ask yourself, where do you stand in relationship to this question? And the question is, when you get to where you are going or aspiring to get in your life, where are you really going to be? Think about that. Look at it. Ask yourself a question. Ask yourself that question. That's what Resurrection Sunday is all about, brothers and sisters, because if there's no eternity, then you're going to live for time and time only. And if you're living for time, what is it that you want out of this life? When you get to where you are going or you are aspiring to get to, it, to in your life, where are you truly going to be? In fact, you may even have the privilege, some of you may have the privilege of reaching those goals and dreams, but you will discover, according to the Bible, that life is vanity, vanity without understanding the importance of the resurrection life in time and in the eternal state. Ask yourself another question. You see, this is to examine yourself, to see where you are in faith and in your life. How are you buying the lie? Are you buying that vicious lie that looking for more pleasure will make you happy and your life more meaningful? If you get it, that is. Solomon, by the way, as we know, said that Solomon said that you will get so tired.
tired and sick of it. You will get tired of it. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11. And by the way, he said that as someone, as we know, that has attained it. He was the richest man, as many of us know, in the world at that time. The richest man. And he said, if you're looking for more pleasure that will make you happy or to make your life more meaningful, you're not going to find it. I hate to tell you, you're not going to find it. It is not there. It does not exist. Now, are you buying the lie? Solomon also said, are you going to center your life around those precious children of, of yours? A lot of parents do that. Guilty. Guilty as charged. The holiday season is here. Let's have the family over. Let's have the kids over. Let's have mom over. Let's have the father over, the sisters, the brothers. But Solomon said, if you're going to center your life around your children, Solomon tried it, and he said, it's vanity, vanity in, Ecclesi in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He learned the lesson. Now, are you going to look for happiness for money, wealth, and prosperity? Some of you are doing that right now. Some of you are not even here because you're doing that right now. It's probably because you don't really believe what Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, really represents, which is the fact that the day that you die, you are going home to be with the Lord face to face, and eventually you are going to have a resurrection body, and that's going to be how you live forever. Think about that. For all of eternity, because of the resurrection because of the resurrection, you are going to be able to do that. So again, are you looking for happiness for money, wealth, and prosperity? Again, Solomon tried it and had it, and he said it's vanity. Now, are you going to look for happiness by building a reputation? Who doesn't want a great reputation? I want everyone to think well of me. I want everyone to love me. Solomon tried that in Ecclesiastes 7, and he said it's vanity. Now, are you going to look for happiness in sex and intimate relationships? Who doesn't want that? Especially that love, intimate relationship. Solomon tried it, and he had it. Trust me, he had it in Ecclesiastes 7. And he said, it's vanity, vanity of vanities, he said. And finally, Solomon concluded this in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. He says, the conclusion to all these tests, there were eight tests, as many of us know, that he took and that he wanted these tests to teach us, mankind. He said, the conclusion, when all has been heard, is this. Respect and honor God and keep his doctrines, because this applies to every single person. And by the way, Romans 15, 4, the Apostle Paul said, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. We are to learn from them that through perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we all might have confidence. Confidence. Now, here's the point, and here's the answer to a lot of these questions I've given to you so far. Without God in your life and understanding the importance of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and resurrection life, life is nothing more than an unfortunate letdown, a huge letdown. That's all it is. Life is nothing more than it's a comma, a pause, but eventually it all becomes is a period. That's all it becomes. And unfortunately, that's so sad. Very sad for a lot of people, as you know. Some of you thought, and you still think, life is going to be great. It's going to be an ecstatic experience, and that you have so much time to get your life right with God. I'll do it later. I have so much time. I'm still young. I'm only 70. I have plenty of time. But it's going to be a letdown for you, period, over and out. Because if you don't understand what resurrection is all about, brothers and sisters, that's where you're going to be forever and ever. And if you don't have any knowledge, I'm, I'm sure some of you that I hear in my voice do not have the knowledge of what the resurrection life is all about. Right now, in time, for you, unfortunately, life is meaningless. You can try to hide it. Many of us have tried, and m many of us still try to hide it. You can play the game of sublimation. You can fill in your time with your friends, your family, your, your loved ones, your schedule, your children, your job, the wealth. But eventually, you're going to hit that brick wall. <laughs> Pastor does it so much better. You're going to hit that brick wall, and you're going to realize that without God, we, my friends, have absolutely nothing, nothing at all. James put it like this in James 4.13. Come now, 
you who say today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a city. We're going to travel. We're going on vacation. We're going to plan a great vacation. And you say today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a city. We're going to spend a year there and then we're going to engage in business and we're going to make a profit. And then he said in James 4, 4 14, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're going to have no idea. I could confidently, confidently say right now, I can confidently say this to you brothers and sisters, that before this day is over, someone that's listening to my voice, before this day is over, someone could be dead. That's a very good possibility. Again, the point is that do you, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. None of us do. You are just a vapor, James says. You're a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, this is not designed to make any of you condemned. None of us. This is just designed to ask you to face the reality of what life, this life that God's given you, what is it? What is it truly about? Now, with the time that I have, I'm going to read you one more story. We all remember the Ronald Reagan era, don't we? What a great era that was. When Raymond Donovan was the Secretary of Labor, he had an experience of riding for the first time in Air Force One. He tells the story about being right next to Ronald Reagan's compartment, and, then, and in between them, was the desk of the president that was used in Air Force One. Donovan said that he was called to join the president and other dignitaries for lunch, which was the first experience he ever had. He was thrilled one day when he walked through the narrow doorway of Air Force One. And the red phone, oh, that red phone on the desk began to ring. Donovan thought, my God, that's the red phone. His response was, I was transfixed 50,000 feet high, sensing the thrill of being at the president's elbow while a vital part of history was about to be made. Reagan took the phone and said, uh-huh, right? What are my options? Donovan said, I stood there breathless. What are my options? This is some strategic and important moment in American history, and I am going to be part of it. I can't believe it. And then he listened as President Reagan said, right? All right, I guess I'll have to take the iced tea. He said, <laughs> he said the rest of the trip was a downer. He said, I looked forward to this marvelous trip across the skies where I thought history was going to be made and all the guy was doing was ordering iced tea. <laughs> and you see, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, for many people, so many people, some even listening to my voice right now, I guarantee you is nothing more than iced tea. That's all it is. But for those of us who believe and are well informed, we know that he is alive and we are free, period, over and out. So I'm going to ask Sam to come on up. Thank you, royal family. She's going to finish that story for us, eventually. But you did so great. I think I can take next Sunday off. We can do the whole message. No, we actually really enjoy doing this together. Um, today is the absolute most greatest love story rescue mission. And that's what we're really celebrating today. Um, that vast exclamation point for some Easter Resurrection Sunday is just a period for others. In fact, it just simply drops off at the end of the sentence. It's nothing more than an empty ritual. We'll close this service with this morning, noting a ritual that's very meaningful to us, the Lord's Supper. But for some people, this is just a ritual. It doesn't mean anything to them because they've always been taught to do that. But they don't know the significance behind it and the spiritual application. Now, it may surprise you, by the way, if you're here this morning, it may surprise you that you are in good company. If you feel like at times these holidays just seem like a downer, you who consider yourself an onlooker today, I'm happy to say that there are many in this room, many of us in this room right now, who at one time were onlookers just like you. 
You may not feel a part of the Christian family, and you may feel like you're on the outside, you're not on the inside, but are kept on the outside because maybe you don't understand all the doctrinal terms or the songs that we will sing at times. Listen to me. You are in good company. You are surrounded by people who are called saints in the scripture. But I want to tell you something else. We are no better than you. That's not, there's not a person in this room that's better than you. The difference in some cases is simply the eternal destiny that some people have and the understanding of it. And unfortunately, many of God's people, for many of God's people, there isn't much of a difference in their lives. In fact, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people have been turned off from church and Christianity because they look like they look at the phonies. They see the hypocrisy. They see the majority of people who call themselves Christians but don't have the truth that sets them free. So the natural instinct is to just simply be turned off by it. But let me tell you something. If you consider yourself to be like that, we are here to tell you, if you begin to understand what this word of God is all about, what this book right here is all about, the Bible, and understand about resurrection life, you're going to find out that there's a lot of meaning behind it that can give your life meaning, purpose, and definition. And we want to tell you something else. Do you realize that the first Easter was simply something that was terrible for the disciples? It was terrible for them. They felt like they had the, the wind knocked out of them. We're in good company because the disciples in those days of Jesus were just as despondent and depressed as many people are today. They did not expect for the Lord to be raised from the dead. They didn't expect the resurrection. The first Easter was a time when they were depressed. And remember when Mary said that he had risen from the dead and the disciples said, you're crazy? That's not true. Well, these disciples are going to get a fresh wind, and we hope this message gives you a fresh wind as well. Have you ever felt like you got the wind knocked out of you? I'm sure that's how the disciples felt for three days, like they got the, the wind knocked right out of them. And, you know, sin will knock the wind out of you, but something else that will keep the wind knocked out of you is unforgiveness. And this is why Christ went to the cross so that we can be forgiven and live forever with him, forever in a resurrection, in resurrection life, in a resurrection body. And we want to talk to you about this because we all need a fresh wind. We really do. We as individuals need a fresh wind, and we as the pivot need a fresh wind. But if you want a fresh wind, you have to look at the wind of your life. You have to examine yourself. You got to get this thing out of your life. You got to stop jumping on the ships that you know are going to lead you astray. But two, you have to forgive the people who did things to you that were totally unfair and totally unjust. You have to forgive them. And sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's so painful, but it's actually required to live the spiritual life. It's actually something that our Lord ensures that we have to forgive people so that we can love people. We have to forgive people so that we can move on. I want to read you all something I think is really, really amazing. It's actually the science behind the crucifixion. It says, normally to breathe in, the diaphragm, the large muscle that separates the chest cavity from the ab abdominal cavity, must move down. This enlarges the chest cavity and ear automatically into the lungs. To exhale, the diaphragm raises up, which compresses the ear. Again, this is the science behind the crucifixion. Then it says, as Jesus hangs on the cross, the weight of his body pulled down on the diaphragm, and the ear moved into his lungs, and it just remained there, the weight. Do you understand that the weight that Jesus was carrying was the weight of our sin? So who knocked the wind out of Jesus in this moment? We did. Our sin. Some of you might have had the wind knocked out of you. Maybe someone you love and trusted hurt you. It's weighty. It hurts. It feels hard to breathe. But in this moment, it remained there, and Jesus must, must push up on the nails in his feet, causing him more pain in order to exhale. In order to speak, ear must pass through the vocal cords in exhalation. 
The gospel notes that Jesus spoke seven times on the cross. So seven times Jesus had to inhale. Excuse me. Jesus had to inhale and push up on his nails just so his diaphragm would be able to get ear in to say the words that he was going to say. And you know, we know there's the seven sayings, but one of those sayings that Jesus said, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is painful to forgive. It is painful to carry sin. It's weighty. It hurts. It literally compresses the ear from you. But you know what it also says about getting the wind knocked out of you? Although it is scary, it's actually not life-threatening. Why is it not life-threatening when you see a moment like this, when someone gets sacked, when somebody is in that kind of pain? Because it's not the ear that goes anywhere. It's the inside of you that needs to heal. Jesus himself, it didn't knock life out of him. Maybe it seems so for three days. Because the power of the presence of God, the spirit of God, filled his body, and revived him back to life. The wind of God brought him back to life. All three members of the Trinity had a part in our Lord's resurrection. We know that. And in Romans 8, it says, the same spirit that brought Jesus back to life, that raised Jesus from the dead, is the same spirit living inside of you, living inside of me. So the same spirit that brought ear into his lungs, that revived him to be able to breathe again, walk in wholeness and fullness is the same spirit in us. Yes, he's the son of God, but you are God's child too. This wind is also offered to you to revive you. What is reviving? It means to breathe new life into you, to give you a fresh wind, to give you a breath of ear. Some of us need that today. There are people today who have recognized, you know what? I am following the wind of God. I am moved by the Spirit of God. And we encourage you to keep going with it. Stand firm in your faith. Follow Paul's instructions. Don't be afraid. Keep doing that. There are others of us who are saying, you know, I'm totally driven by the wind of the world. I'm tossed left and right. I have lost control of my life. I'm led in every different direction because I just keep jumping on the wrong boat, the wrong ship. I keep thinking it's going to be fine. But I'm ready now to jump on the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. Maybe that's you today. Or maybe you're the one who was completely knocked to the ground and you've been on the ground. You've been struggling with depression, struggling with so much anxiety, struggling with guilt and shame and all these things. And maybe some of it was not even anything you did, but something that happened to you unjustly. Today, we want to put it on your heart to forgive that person. Let the Spirit of God fill up in you to forgive that person. Let the Spirit of God come in you to turn towards the narrow road that leads to life. Turn to Jesus, his word, his mind. Why am I saying all of this? Well, number one, I'm passionate about this because if we truly want a fresh wind, all of these things we have to understand. There's action behind some of these things. There's repentance involved, 1 John 1, 9. There's forgiveness that's involved. There's love. There's purposes. All of these amazing things. And I, I believe that because my God says that it's true. I believe everything in the word of God is true and how, it is do- how it's said it will be done. Yes, we are in a hard year and things are crazy, but God is still moving and God still has a purpose. So at this time for the disciples, getting the wind knocked out of them, it was simply a period. But then they opened up their hearts and something happened. We know that because we want to look at Luke chapter 24. I don't know if you're there already, but you can turn to Luke chapter 24, verse 1. I believe I have it on the board for you. I have all the scriptures on the board for you, but it's nice to turn there in in your Bibles. In Luke 24, 1, it says, but on the first day of the week, notice this is our first Easter ever. This is the first Easter, first resurrection celebration day. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices, the spices which they had prepared. Notice, you see, this is the first Easter morning. They weren't going to a sunrise service like some have done this morning. They were not on their way to worship and praise God. They were not excited about what the future held. As a matter of fact, their world had just dropped from underneath them. They all had the wind knocked out of them, so to say. 
They were just eating with the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew 26. Can you imagine when the Lord Jesus Christ came to the Lord, that last supper and he said, this is the last supper, the last meal I'm going to have with you. And I will not have this again until I drink with you and eat with you in my Father's kingdom. And we're going to celebrate that today. And they looked forward to dozens and dozens of more meals like that every year with the Lord Jesus Christ. They looked forward to having this full lifetime with him when his revolution eventually would overthrow Rome and he would finally set up a new kingdom and Israel would no longer be attacked like it has been recently this past October. And they would be among the great charter members of this new kingdom revolutionary band. But instead, they found out that he was crucified period. And they watched as he was arrested, and he was taken away by the crowd, and the crowd treated him very, very roughly. And they saw him in the distance under torch lights as he was being shoved into the Roman barracks. Matthew tells us exactly what happened to these first people who discovered Easter. The day before, or three days before that, we read in Matthew 26, 56, he said, He said, but all the, this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled or may be fulfilled. What then? Then all the disciples left him and fled. All the disciples, the first disciples, those individuals that we think have halos around, over their head. They have churches named after them, St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Jude, St. Thomas. We don't find too many St. Judases, by the way, but there was a Judas besides Iscariot, but I don't think any church wants to call themselves the Church of Judas. But anyway, the fact of the matter is they all left him. They all fled. Nobody stood around. Nobody stood up for him, period. They nailed him to the cross. We've studied that. If that wasn't bad enough, they scourged him, but then they drove spikes into his hands, and they put one foot over another and drove spikes into that. And as he hung on the cross, he looked like he was just about inhuman. He was lifeless. He was dead, period. And then he had two friends, two friends of the disciples named Joseph and Nic Nic Nicodemus. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were Pharisees. They were very, very wealthy. They came to Jesus to embalm the body. And they wrapped his body like you would wrap a mummy. And they tied around him something similar to a kerchief around his head, which we'll see something really cool later on this service about. They tied it under his chin so that as the years passed and his flesh would be actually deteriorating, when the bones would come out, you would not see the skeleton bones really coming out as you would if you were just lying there nude. You see, I say all of this because they knew he was dead. And on top of that, it's also interesting to see that there was a stone. I'll leave my water right there. There was a stone that was rolled down into a hill. It actually put him inside of that tomb so that he could now have captivity, a captivity where he could not get out because people lived in fear that they were going to steal his body. The stone was placed over the grave in those days to keep the dogs out from feeding on the remains of the human body and to keep people from stealing expensive things that they often gave when they buried the dead. But this stone was increasingly important. The stone was very important to those who hated, the, to those who hated Jesus because what this did is they not only put the stone there, but they also put a Roman seal on it. And anyone who ever tried to remove a stone with a Roman seal as the signet ring was placed upon the stone in soft clay, they would be killed or murdered for doing so. And on top of that, they had the temple policemen who were chosen to march around it constantly, 24 hours a day. They were chosen to be there around the tomb. Now, can you imagine what was the big deal? They didn't do that to other tombs. They didn't want the body to be removed. They wanted to make sure that what Jesus said would never, ever transpire because they knew that there was something supernatural about this man. When he said he could open up the eyes of the blind, he did. When he said he could raise the dead, he did. When he said he could open up the ears of the deaf, he did. So they were very, very concerned as to whether or not he would fulfill his word. 
Hold your place in Luke, and we're going to go to John chapter 2, right around the corner. We're going to go from John to Luke and John to Luke, back and forth. So if you want to put your bookmark in there. Some of our Lord's enemies believed more about what he said than his disciples actually did. Look at John chapter 2, verse 19. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews therefore said it took 46 years to build this temple, and you, will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And then they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. They knew what he had said. Uh, go forward to chapter 10 of the Gospel of John, and we're going to look at verse 17. Don't worry, we're going to get back to Ed in Florida. Ed is a really cool dude, as you'll see. John 10, verse 17. For this reason, for this reason, the Father loves me. Notice what, what he says. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has it, no one has, has the ability to take it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. He says, I have authority to lay it down, and he did. Then I have authority to raise it back up again, and he did. Jesus Christ had a part in his own resurrection. This commandment I received from my father. He said that not only he would be crucified, but that he would be raised from the dead. And so in their minds, it would be just like those disciples to try to get his body, kidnap his body, and fake a resurrection. So the Romans said, that's what they thought, we better seal the tomb. All right, let's go back to Luke 24. We're going to keep going, Luke to John, John to Luke, because we want to see this. Again, this is, by the way, the behind the scenes, familiar scenes to these people who are making their way to the first Easter morning before dawn, where Luke said it was the first day of the week in Luke 24, 1. At early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. We don't do that today. Today, we bring love notes or words of sympathy, or we send flowers to those who are grieving. In those days, because of the stench of the human remains, to cover that, they would put heavily spiced and expensive spices and place them around the tomb so that it would be a place of beauty rather than a place of horror and death. And notice verse 2, as they worked their way up this narrow trail, here's the first people that went to the, the, the first Easter service. They were like some of us. They were not expecting a change in their life. They were not expecting for someone to be risen from the dead. They were not expecting that a miracle had taken place. They were not expecting that they were going to have their lives totally changed by finally believing what our Lord said about resurrection life. And so as they worked their way up to that narrow trail that led them to the sealed tomb, notice what Dr. Luke says, and they found the stone. Now, this is great. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, wait a minute. Something very interesting here that we want you to see. The Greek does not actually say they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. The Greek says they found the stone apokoleo. It means it was rolled up a hill from the tomb. It was rolled up. And this stone weighed tons. It was rolled up from the tomb, a multi-toned stone rolled up. And by the way, you see, critics have said for years that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was taken. Now, think about this with me. Just think naturally. Use your natural mind. Use your common sense. Critics have said for years that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was taken and that he was kidnapped. So stop and think about that for a moment. His body's gone. Let's say his enemies took him. But wait a minute. Why would the enemies want to take his body? The last thing that they wanted was the fact that the body would be missing. They wanted the body so that they could do the same thing that Muslims can do. They can see the corpse of Muhammad, who once lived, or the Buddhists do. They can see the corpse of Buddha. It's very interesting that we cannot find the body of Jesus, the dead one. No matter how hard we try, it's not there because you can't find something among the dead that is among the living. And we have the only one that claims to have been risen from the dead. 
And so the last thing that his enemies wanted to happen was for the body to be taken. They wanted the body to remain there. That's why they sealed the tomb. So as an onlooker, maybe you would say, well, maybe his enemies didn't do it, but maybe his friends took him. Well, how could they? Think about it. There were guards there, according to the word of God. The tomb was sealed. The stone weighed tons, and this was the one thing that they didn't want to happen. And by the way, if the guards allowed someone to take the body of Jesus, they would have had their heads cut off because once the Roman guard failed in protecting someone, like we learn in Acts 16, 30, 31, or in taking care of their prisoners, if they failed, they would be put to death. They did not want that to happen. Well, a lot of people say, well, maybe he did not die. Maybe he had just collapsed and then he slipped out somewhere from the tomb, inside the tomb. He pushed that stone right up the hill, that multi-ton stone, and he just left and it just so happened that everyone was asleep. You know, it takes more faith to believe that than it does to believe the resurrection. I mean, he's inside. His body is all wrapped up, by the way. He's not Houdini, okay? His body is all wrapped up. Do you think that if there was a sign of life that Nicodemus and Joseph would have done what they did? Go forward to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 19. We're going to look at verse 38. Bear with us. We are going to get to Ed. And look at John 19, verse 38. And by the way, we just want you to think this morning and ask yourself on the way home privately, is Easter a comma, something I'm thinking about? Is it a period? It's done. That's it. End of the story. Is it a question mark? Is it real? Or is it an exclamation point, something that's very meaningful in my life? So again, do you think that if there was any sign of life that Nicodemus and Joseph would have continued to wrap his body? Look at verse 38. And after these things, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of, the, of Jesus, but a secret one because he lived in fear of the Jews, and that's what a lot of Christians are today, secret Christians because they live in fear of what others are going to say. But it says again, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission. He came, therefore, and took away his body, and Nicodemus came also, who had first come to him by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about uh, 100 pounds weight. I have this on the board for you, excuse me. About 100 pounds weight. And so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in that place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, which no one had been yet laid. Therefore, on account of the Jewish day of preparation, because of the Passover, because the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there because the Passover was coming. So again, do you think that if there was any sign of life that Nicodemus and Joseph would have continued to wrap his body and put him into the grave? Not on your life. He was dead, and dead men don't walk, and dead men don't push stones from inside the tomb up a hill. All right, let's go back to Luke 24, and we're going to look at verse 2. Luke 24, 2. Now notice again, they found the stone when it came on that first Easter morning. Now remember, we're talking, we're not talking about people like you and I. The majority of us came here today because we're celebrating the resurrection. The majority of us are here today because we're excited about the fact that he's risen from the dead, and so will we be. The disciples were not. So when they found the stone, I need to get this up here for you, okay. I missed a few slides there. So when they found the stone, verse 2, when they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, 
Now the period has turned into a massive question mark. Before he's dead, he's dead, he's in the grave, he's died. We're, we're not going to eat with him anymore. He's in the grave and he's dead. There's no life for us now. They got the wind knocked out of them. But all of a sudden, the missing body or the resurrection body goes from a period to a question mark. Where is he? It's very interesting. And by the way, if his body could have been produced, all of us Christians, we'd have to wave that white flag. Or we'd have to surrender and say we're de defeated because if there's no resurrection, then our faith is in vain. We're living for nothing. It's silly, just go live like hell, have the best time we can, break as many rules without getting caught, and then at the end of our lives, it's over, period. But if there's a resurrection, and because there is a resurrection, we're going to have to do what Solomon said, someday stand before him and hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, respect his commands, because this applies to every person. Then all of a sudden, the priorities of our life begin to change. The morals and the values that we have begin to change. Now we find out that there is something more important than just the natural things that we're living for on this earth. So all the critic or all Satan would have to do is somehow, some way, provide the skeleton of Jesus Christ. And they could say, well, he was just simply another martyr who lived and died, and he was nothing more than a well-meaning prophet whose life had a mark on history, but nothing more than that. He'd be just like Confucius, just like Buddha, just like Muhammad, whose bodies are still there after death. However, They've not been able to find his body, and you say, well, surely the enemy took it and hid it. No, not at all. Why? Because the enemy wouldn't want to hide the body. The enemy would want the body to show you that he was a fraud. And you say, well, why did the Christians even begin to preach the resurrection after Christ died? Why were all of them willing to die for it? Why were they willing to be thrown into dens of thieves or dens of lions and, and die for that which they believed? Well, because they saw it. Many of them saw it. In 1 Corinthians 15.6, Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one time. And we have documented throughout church history and throughout the New Testament that there were more than one or two people that have seen him elsewhere. And the proof of that, that they had seen him, is the fact that they were willing to die for what he said. Now, you're not willing to die for what a person has said unless you know that person is supernatural. Now remember, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus Christ out. He was already gone. He didn't have to say, I think I, I need to, to remove the stone because I'm going to be resurrected. He walked through walls. He, he, he walked through stone walls. He probably walked right through that multi-ton rock. So no, the, so, the stone was, was not rolled away to let Jesus Christ out. It was rolled away to let the world in, to let the world see what went on, you see? The stone was rolled away to let the world in who is deceived by Satan. In 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 1 Timothy 4, 1, Revelation 12, 9, 13 through 14, uh, Revelation 20, verses 3 to 10. Satan deceives the whole world. He does it through the school system. He does it through education, through the media, through television, through the internet, social media. Wherever he can deceive the world, he does. The stone was rolled away to let us in, not let the Lord Jesus Christ out. Look at verse 3 of Luke 24. When they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. Don't you love that? Look at verse 4. Here we go. From a period... What, what do we have? We have a question mark now. And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, notice that the period is no longer a period. It's now a question mark. In some cases, that's worse than a period because now they're beginning to wonder in doubt. However, it was bad enough that he was taken under arrest, bad enough that he was scourged, and that he was nailed to the cross, and then he died, and he was embalmed, and then he was in the tomb. Now they go to pay their respects, and he's gone. And they're not thinking resurrection. You see, that's why we went to the Gospel of John. John 2, John 2, 22, it says, After Jesus had been raised from the dead, it says, The disciples believed after they had seen him. Like Thomas said, Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I see. Sorry, guys, my slides are all messed up. 
And, uh, and for Doubting Thomas to believe and then have Doubting Thomas willing to lose his life and be martyred means that the doubter did not have any more questions. He saw the resurrected Christ. And so they, right now, they came to the, pay their respects, but he's gone. As far as they're concerned, probably one of the enemies took his body away, but they're perplexed about this, and we love this, what we see in verse 4, and it happened. Now remember, this is Easter morning, it's dawn, it's not sunny out yet. You'll see why in a moment. It happened that while they were perplexed, it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men, and these are actually angels, two men so suddenly stood near them in dazzling apparel, dazzling clothes. Verse 5, and as it, the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, the angels said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? By the way, you know why it says as the women were terrified and by, bowed their flat flat faces to the ground because the men didn't go back there to see him. They were afraid. Now, the men were having a difficult time. The men were all hiding somewhere, wondering what they're going to do next because, after all, they've given up their profession for three years, and they follow this guy who claims to be the Messiah, and now he's dead. But the woman went there. They just kept saying, I know he's dead, and I, I love him, and I just want to go there, and I want to show my res more respect and more honor. And that's what it says in verse 5. As the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the angels, not the men, the angels said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, let me tell you something. I'll tell you. You know what gets your attention at 5 a.m. in the morning when you're walking through a cemetery? <laughs> Dazzling angels. And by the way, where were the guards? Well, they were concerned about what happened. So they had a little council meeting, and they met with the Supreme Court of the Jews, and they worked out what we would call a deal. I'm going to paraphrase what Matthew says. I'll go through it quickly. Matthew says, Some of the temple police who had been guarding the tomb went to the chief priests and told them what happened. A meeting of all the Jewish leaders was called, and it was decided to bribe the police to say that they had been fallen asleep when Jesus, when Jesus' disciples came during the night and stole his body. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Think about it. Let's use our common sense again. If they're all asleep, how do they know that Jesus' disciples came and took him through the night? I thought you were sleeping. The disciples came and they stole the body. How do you know the disciples were doing that if they were sleeping? See, it doesn't make sense. It's all foolish. That's why it's not a question mark for us. It's not a comma. It's not a period. It is an ex exclamation point. He has risen, and so will we. Now, if you have that attitude that resurrection life doesn't begin when you die, it can begin right now in time. On Easter morning, <laughs> it can begin right now. Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is an exclamation point for you. Let's look at verse 4. And it happened, notice verse 4, it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them. They were angels in dazzling apparel. As the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, and the men said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. Verse 6, he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you, Bible doctrine, by the way, while he was still in Galilee saying that, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Look at verse 8, Luke 24. And they remembered his words. Those are the 12 minus Judas. Now, they were Mary Magdalene, here's the ladies, and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James. Also, the other women were with them, and they were telling these things to the apostles, and these words appeared to them as nonsense. Are you listening this morning? Bear with us. That's the first Easter for the so-called holy people. And I mean, we don't see churches called 
St. Mary Magdalene, probably a lot of guys would go there, but other than that, we don't see churches called that. We don't see churches honoring women. Here it is, notice verse 11. And probably this is true for some of you who are listening or what you're hearing. These words appear to them, not you who are here, but some maybe out there. These words appear to them as nonsense, and they would not believe. The period's gone, the commas are away, the question marks are removed, and as for us believers, here is one massive ex exclamation point. We got it, and we believe it. They announced it to his disciples, and then even the disciples didn't believe it at first. But later on, they did. The periods were gone, the commas went away, the question marks were removed, and they had that one massive exclamation point, which says, in effect, we believe it, and we got it which is another way of saying when things like this happen um, and you're listening to something like this and you really believe it and all of a sudden it clicks and you say, you know what? What they're saying makes sense. Not who they are, but what they're saying makes sense. It's not who I am that matters. It's the message that matters. You don't focus in on the messenger. You might have said it a little bit better. I say as best as I know how, but it's always the message. That's what happens. And to the onlooker, all of this meaning as to the excuse me and to the onlooker all of this means nothing to a lot of people but to us christians who understand these principles we remember christ died we re remember he's alive we gather on easter sunday when easter comes up we're together because there's just something about easter with the resurrection holiday that's why uh we're going to hear ed in a moment but that's why we like to say to some of you, oh, by the way, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, happy Thanksgiving, have a good Fourth of July, you know, we'll see you next Easter. <laughs> but to us, life is very meaningful when you understand resurrection. All right, you guys ready? I got my phone right there. You guys ready for Ed in Florida? My dad's going to tell us about him. Who are you ready for? I forgot the other story. <laughs> I forgot that part. His full name is Eddie Riddenbacker. He's a captain. He was a captain in World War II. He flew a B-17 flying fortress. He was sent on a mission to take a message to Gen uh, General Douglas MacArthur and to be involved in other strategies. He had seven other men chosen on that crew that flew across the waters of the uh, Pacific to locate General MacArthur. Somehow in the navigation of that flight, they got things cross-wired and the plane crashed in the water. Miraculously, they all made their way out of the plane. No one was injured to the point of death. They climbed into this little raft and as they floated on the seas, they fought the sun, they fought sharks. But most of all, they fought hunger. As all eight of these men ate in very little, they drank very little, little. Finally, by the eighth day, their rations ran out, no food, no water. They had reached the end. They were, uh, they were all, uh, uh, by the way, believers, and they knew that they needed a miracle, so no one knew where they were. They were hundred, uh, hundreds of miles from land. Riddenbacker says that they had an afternoon devotional, and in that service, they prayed for a miracle. And they, uh, they, uh, they, tried, they tried to rest, but they could not. He remembers leaning back and pulling his military cap over his nose and trying to doze. While the other crew members were asleep, he remembers feeling something land on his cap. It was a seagull. He thought, if I could capture this sucker, we'd have supper. He got it. He tore the feathers off it. And he shared a little a morsel of it together with the others. And then they used the, intestine, the intestines for fish bait. And they began to fish. And they caught uh, their food, which gave them not only food, but more bait. And they were able to survive until they were found and rescued almost at the end of their lives. Old Ed never forgot. He never stopped saying thank you. So that once a week, every Friday evening, late at night, he would come to that old pier with a filled bucket of shrimp and a heart full of gratitude saying, thank you, thank you. It was almost as though the seagulls understood, uh, though 40 or 50 years had passed and old Eddie would die later on, it seemed like they understood when he said thank you. That's exactly what we do when we come at Easter. We come and what we're saying 
is thank you. Now, Ed looked very, very weird to us at the beginning of the service. But you see, when you're informed and you know the information, that which may seem weird to others may be very, very meaningful to you. We have people that gather together here every night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. And they come here all the time. You know how they look to others? Very, very weird. You go to church five times a week? Are you nuts? Well, well, if you come here, you know it's not, not like church. It's like teaching. It's like a college. It's learning about life. When you really love God, a lot of these things that seem to be meaningless... Why would someone get up early in the morning to go to a, uh, a, a service, in the sunrise service? Why do Christians make such a big deal out of this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, Palm Sunday, Christmas? Why do they make such a big deal out of it? Because it's their way of saying thank you to a God who has saved them from eternal de- uh, damnation. It's our way to say thank you. And so to the uninformed, it's not meaningful. But to those that have the information, life becomes more and more meaningful as they continue to grow in God's grace and knowledge. Let's bow our heads. All right, we are going to bow our heads and close in prayer, please. Uh, If you are here this morning and you've never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you that God loves you with a very precious love, that he sent his uniquely born son to die for your sins. For the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You have the opportunity right now to begin resurrected life by becoming a believer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You can tell God right now, forming the sentences in thought only, that you are willing to believe upon his son, Jesus Christ, for eternal life. What a great day to do it. We bring into remembrance the resurrection of Christ. This is your guarantee that you will be resurrected with him. And Father, we also close now at this time. We want to get ready for our Lord's Supper. We pray that anyone here this morning who may already be born again and saved, but they want to begin to know the resurrected life, to have life filled with meaning, purpose, and definition. It's a private matter between you and them, Lord. And so we pray right now that they would just extend their faith toward you and that you would, for them to have an intimate relationship that gives them so much meaning and purpose in their lives. So may your blessing be upon the closing moments of our service. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is risen. Amen. Thank you, Samantha. All right, if we could have the ushers come forward, please. We're going to close our Easter service by bringing into remembrance the Lord's Supper now. Thank you so much. Background music would be a little nice there, Bobby. Deacon Bobby.
Okay, thank you, ushers. Uh, as you know, after this morning's message, we have no reason not to make this the most serious time ever in our lives because it's so important. Again, it has nothing to do with how much time we're here on earth. It has to do with whether we're taking in doctrine daily, and that's what really gives us, strengthens our faith. So this is a very serious time, and it's a great opportunity for us. So let us bring into remembrance all the things that he has done for us on the cross. What an important time to re bring all of that, all that he has done into remembrance. So please remember, this is a time to bring into remembrance and think about him and who he is and all that he has done for you and I. Really think about it. Just like uh, this man, Captain Eddie Reckenbecker, he never forgot the sacrifice of that first life-saving seagull that came down from heaven to save the lives of those men. So we too, we have the bread that came down from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord provided that seagull so that their lives would be saved on this earth, this earth. God provided the Lord Jesus Christ, that, the, that lamb that was slain so that our lives would be saved forever, not just on this earth, but forever, and that we would have eternal life. That's what we have to look forward to. And so if Eddie Reckenbecker can go every Friday night and do what he does to show his gratitude and not care that he made, makes a fool of himself, what we do as we have this communion service, it doesn't look weird at all because we are all gathered together as the body of Christ here throughout, not just physically, but throughout just in spirit, we're gathered together. And, and we remember in the same way the unbelievable sacrifice and the unbelievable gift, amazing gift that came down from heaven. And so if we could just turn to Matthew 26, beginning with verse 26, which I will read. Verse 26, now while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, the, eat, this is my body. So with that said, let us eat the bread. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, the blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, verse 29, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. Let us drink the cup. We could just bow our heads. Father, we just want to thank you for this great opportunity to, that, to come before you and celebrate this ritual. The only one that's commanded in the church age that has meaning to the extent that we understand this great mystery, the mystery of Jesus Christ, his person and his work. And we also ask you, Father, now to give us the courage and the strength to never forget this message that we had today about the risen Lord and that we may apply it and not only apply it to our lives but share this vital information with other people in our lives who truly need it, Father. And of course, we ask these things in the name of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, well, I hope you have a great Resurrection Sunday, and I just wanted to say one more. Oh, Charlie's going to come and pray for the orphan. I thought he was just going to, I thought he was just going to write me a big check yes, and say, say we don't have anything to do. No, I'll, I just wanted to say that um, my wife and I, as you know, many of you who are still here, thank you for being here. and. and and for the new people, thank you for having faith in this ministry. My wife and I, we never claimed to know that we knew what was, what was going to take place after our pastor uh, went away 
went to be home with the Lord, face to face with the Lord. That's where he is. This is our first uh, Resurrection Sunday without him. But we never claimed to know exactly what we were doing. We didn't. But we knew that if we had faith in God, that he was going to take us exactly where we wanted to be. And that's where we are, exactly where we want to be. So I hope you continue to be part of it and help us to keep this, this ministry going with us because that is our true desire. Again, it doesn't mean we know exactly what we're doing, but we do know this. We know that we have to have faith in him and trust in him, and he will show us the way, just like he has shown every single disciple in that book the way. He's going to show us all the way. And I hope you are all part of it, or at least be, know that we desire the same thing that you do. So thank you for that. I'm going to ask Charlie to come on up and pray for the orphan before we let you go. Good morning. So I'm going to pray for the offering, but before I do, I just wanted to read something to the congregation. This is something I found online this week, and it was really interesting. It was, um, why did Jesus fold the napkin at his burial? Why did Jesus fold the linen burial cloth at, after his resurrection. I've never noticed this before. The Gospel of John 20 verse 7 tells us that the napkin was placed over the face of Jesus, was not just thrown aside like grave clothes. The Bible takes an entire verse to tell us that the napkin was folded neatly and was placed separate from the grave clothes. Early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and I don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb to see. The other disciple outran Peter and got there first. He stooped, he stooped in and looked and saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. And while the cloth that had covered Jesus' face was folded up and lying to the side. Was that important? Absolutely. This is very significant. In order to understand the significance of the folded napkin, you have to understand a little bit about the Hebrew tradition of that day. The folded napkin had to do with the master and the servant. And every Jewish boy knew this tradition. When the servant set the dinner table for the master, he made sure it was exactly the way the master wanted it. The table was furnished per perfectly, and then the servant would wait just outside out sight, out of sight of the master until the master had finished eating. And the servant would not dare touch the table until the master was finished. Now, if the master were done eating, he would rise from the table, wipe his fingers, his mouth, and clean his beard. And he would wad up the napkin and toss it onto the table. The servant then would go, he, he then would know to clear the table. For in those days, the wadded napkin meant, I'm done. But if the master got up from the table, and folded his napkin and laid it beside his plate, the servant would not dare touch the table because the folded napkin meant I'm coming back. So he's coming back. So let's just uh, bow for the offering. Father, we ask that you bless this offering. We ask that you bless the remainder of this day. Bless every, each and every one here today. We ask that we, we thank you for your son and our Lord and Savior and all that he's done for us, all that work that he's done for us on the cross. We appreciate you, we appreciate him, the Holy Spirit. In his name we pray, amen.
Okay, brothers and sisters, happy Resurrection Sunday. We will see you back here this coming Sunday. You are dismissed.